Okay, so I suppose we can start now. Um, welcome to Ecology and Society session. And our first presenter today is, how do I go to the presentation? <laughs> okay, Judy Shamon, utilizing existing earth observation networks to monitor and forecast aerial movements of animals for science and society. I suppose the presentation should be just... <coughs> Where are the slides? Mm -hmm. uh, he said they're going green. Yeah, they, they should be in the folder over here. Ah, okay. Yeah, just in the folder. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for being here uh, this morning. Um, what I'd like to do today is tell you about an Earth observation system that I think many of you are really familiar with, but probably not within the context of ecological research. Um, and it's a system that we use to study aerial movements of animals. So many, many animals use the air to travel through for their daily requirements, to move between uh, su seasonably suitable habitats. And at certain times of year, we can see huge pulses of animals that are in the air, insects, birds, bats, millions of animals moving around at one time or other, sometimes traveling thousands of kilometers within a single flight. And if you consider those mass movements, and they're interesting that not only in and of themselves, but also because they can have a huge impact on ecosystem services, for example. So through these large-scale movements, also these pulses of large numbers of animals moving at a single time um, through the transport of nutrients or toxins. And we've heard several talks during the last few days um, about this. Also the transport of, of seeds, for example, pollen, but parasites and pathogens. And of course, as large numbers of animals leave one area and move into another, you can expect huge trophic consequences as well through different types of species interactions. But there are also other reasons why we're interested in studying animal movement in the air, um, especially because human wildlife conflicts in the air are increasing over time. So we're increasingly enroaching on the aerial environment through our static structures like wind turbines, buildings, but also even light is changing the way animals move. It's changing the environment itself, the aerial environment, and it's making it less safe for animals, but also even for humans, so through conflicts like collisions between birds and aircraft. So the system I want to tell you about is radar, and many of you may be familiar with radar. For example, um, radar is used to make sure that we fly safely, so for air traffic control, it's used to give you uh, tickets, for example, if you drive too fast. Um, but it's also used to check the weather, so many of you may actually check the weather report and see if there's rain coming in, and that's using weather radar. And that's the system that we're talking about. So normally this is an example from a few days ago and you can see rain coming in, picked up by a weather radar. And normally these images are cleaned out of all biological information. But if you would look at the same radar on the night of peak migration, this is what it would look like. And everything in that radar is basically due to millions of birds that are traveling at around the same time, or also insects. <coughs> so radar is a tool that many people use to study migration or large movements of animals. And it's not um, a new tool. It's it was actually discovered already in the Second World War. So there was a first publication by Lack and Varley in 1945 already in Nature, where they were allowed to release a secret military document in which they showed that birds were interfering with their warnings, actually, for identifying enemy aircraft. And that was the first time that they discovered that you can actually use radar to track bird movements. So at the time, they had to actually specially train radar operators to get rid of the bird information to avoid having um, false warnings. And now we're doing the opposite. We try and train ecologists to get rid of all the other information, like weather and aircraft and boats that are even picked up, but to try and extract the biological information. So a few years ago, we started an international network. It's a cost action, so it's a networking activity called NRAM. 
where we have a group of people, an interdisciplinary group of people that have come together to try and actually use these systems that are out there. So you can imagine every country, so these, the green are the countries that are involved in this network, and all the blue dots are operational weather radar that belong to the National Meteorological Institutes. And every one of these radars can actually be used to identify animal migration, actually aerial migration. But we have a lot of work to do, so what we wanted to do is bring together ecologists, ornithologists, entomologists, but also radar engineers and computer scientists to try and tackle a lot of problems we have in order to convert this into something we can really use on a daily basis. So we have to develop algorithms to extract biological information, um, but we also want to find new ways of visualizing the data. And finally, for example, be able to map global flyways, or actually continental level flyways, and study convergent movement patterns. Um, so what I'll do now is give you just a few examples to just the tip of the iceberg so you get an idea of what we can actually do with radar, what's being done, and what we hope to do in the future. So the type of research that's done with weather radar, there are a lot of different types of questions that we tackle. Some are just very basic. We want to know when and where animals actually migrate and what numbers. What is the spatial and temporal patterns? Does most of the migration actually travel in a short number of days across a long season, very short pulses? Um, and then how do they actually migrate? So what are the external and intrinsic factors that drive the patterns that we do observe in space and time. But also, how do they use the underlying landscape? So where do birds actually land? Or where do they emerge from? Large numbers of insects, things like that. How, what types of habitats are important? And we can even use radar to study that. And finally, also things like aggregation. So not only migration, but large aggregates of birds and insects can be studied with radar. So things like summer roosts of large numbers of purple martins in the US, where you have hundreds of thousands of birds staying in a small area in trees, and you can actually quantify that when they emerge, or bat emergence. So now I'll walk you a little bit more slowly just through one or two examples to give you an idea of how this works. So we've been working with the military for many years, and their interest was they have a serious problem with conflicts between birds and aircraft during their training, and they want to reduce the impact that birds have. So their question was, well, when can we predict in advance when we have migrants coming through the area and then decide whether or not we would actually train. So just reduce the impact in advance. And that requires a lot of steps of work before you can actually get there. So the first thing you have to do <coughs> is if you start working with new radars, like the weather radar, is to calibrate them. You need to know what it's actually seeing. When is it looking at birds and when does it see rain, for example. And then develop automated detection algorithms so that it can actually extract the biological information. But once you do that, you can actually get information about speed, density, and travel directions. So that's what you see here. These are the densities through the course of the night. But here you see altitude on this axis, and you can see how high they actually fly, which is important for the military. They can actually decide to fl not to fly or to fly above the birds, for example. And then we convert that using statistical models and the reaction of birds to weather into predictive <coughs> forecast models that they can use to convert into early warnings. This is another gamble. If you watch this screen, you'll see it suddenly light up. And these are all reflections from birds at midnight. This is the Netherlands, and these are the water bodies in the Netherlands. And what happens in a loop again? On midnight in the Netherlands, on New Year's Eve, everybody is allowed to shoot off fireworks. And it's a crazy, like you have a very civilized country, and people go absolutely crazy, and everyone can shoot fireworks off from their backyard and in the street. And what you see here is a huge <coughs> response of water birds. So hundreds of thousands of birds that overwinter in the Netherlands, ducks and geese, that all take off during this mass dis disturbance. So we can measure actually the altitudes and the densities, and here you can see a huge pulse just after midnight every single year. So these are the kinds of things that we can do. Um, and this is something, for example, that got a lot of media, gets a lot of media attention every year. So what are we doing next is trying to now build up this scope. What happens if we can now move away from only our small local studies and scale up across the continent? So we're not able to do that yet. But this is an example of something we just put together um, in the last few weeks. This is an example from France. And each colored arrow here is a separate weather radar. And the colors represent the density of birds measured through an entire night of migration. So the lighter blues are very low migration densities, and this is very high migration density. And the length of the arrow shows you the speed and direction of flight. The black shows you the wind speed and direction. And what's unusual about this day is that generally winds are blowing against the current of migration. So winds are generally blowing this way in autumn migration. We have a few nights of beautiful weather, and suddenly we see a huge influx of birds. So we can actually get an idea of what the spatial pattern of this, what we call broad front migration is, just how broad is it. We also see that, and something we expect, is that birds, once they reach the coast, 
you see very little migration. They try and avoid the coast because they don't want to cross large bodies of water, which is expensive and very, very dangerous. But not only, so not only do we get these spatial patterns, we try to understand their behavior, but actually what's really exciting now is that we can try and quantify how many birds are actually in the air over such a large area. And if we do a very, very rough estimate just around the area of a radar, 25 kilometer radius, we come up with this single night with an estimate of 175 million birds crossing this country at one point in time, so on one night. And this gives us an opportunity to really start quantifying aerial biomass. So I'm going to skip this. So this is an example of another type of activity that we're doing. So this is, an in, this is a collaboration with computer scientists and visual designers. And our task for them was that we have these five radars, these dots. And it's very hard for us as biologists, but also when we want to communicate to the public, how do you integrate all of this information? Birds moving in space and time, different speeds and directions. Can we create a visualization which gives us an idea of what this flow is over the course of a night? And then that's what you see here. So you see um, mainly the speeds and directions. And if you watch closely, you can see how it differs across the spatial extent of this night. So we see birds moving in this way, and, th and later in the night we see migrants coming over from, from the UK. So we see actually two flows of migration that are crossing each other on a single night. And the idea here is that if we work with other people, so for ecologists we don't have time to really work on these kind of visualizations and test them, but we have other people that are interested in developing these kinds of tools mm -hmm. and putting them on public platforms so that we can create a kind of plug and play system. So we've tested this for Europe, and in fact, we then tested this for a case study in North America as well, just to see if it works on similar systems. So what's next? Because we have a lot of plans, but we also realize it's very easy and a short thing to make it look like it's very simple and everything is ready and we can study migration across the entire continent. But in fact, one of the things we are realizing that we're, re we're running against several difficulties. So first, we really need, we realize we really need to increase awareness of stakeholders. And stakeholders can be ecologists for their own research, um, but also things like aviation safety, pest control, agriculture, so that people realize that there are tools out there, they already exist, they're in the hands of the weather system, but we don't really have access to them yet. Um, so we need, and we also need to develop, so algorithms have been developed to extract this biological information, but they're not implemented on a large scale, so everyone has them running on their own laptop, very problematic. Um, so how do we set that up so they can run internationally, so everybody's looking at the same thing? So we need infrastructure to go with that, and we need a very clear data policy, and that's something that we're really running against. So right now, you basically have to contact each meteorological institute and ask them for their data. You would like to be able to ask, ask the entire community at once and say, okay, can I get continental level information? So these are the things that we're working on. We are confident that it will happen over the coming years, but it is requiring quite a lot of work from a very large community. So with that, um, I hope that I gave you a little bit of an idea. I can convince you that this is a really exciting tool for monitoring aerial movement, also at a continental scale. There's still a lot to be done, but there's really a lot of potential for this um, tool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk, cool stuff there. Um, any questions from the audience, please? Yeah. My question is a very, very small uh, small scale compared to this uh, project. But uh, have you tried, or will you try to uh, to see the um, the movements uh, around, for example, the uh, uh, wind turbine? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so these provide um, somewhat large scale information. So it will provide you the general context of how many migrants are moving over a particular area. It gives you the altitude distributions. Uh, weather radar won't provide you with the exact detailed behavior of an individual bird, for example. So that our idea is you would then integrate that with other information. So you know what the main flux is, for example. You could use other tools if you really wanted to see how exactly a single bird is, is moving. Um, that Can you separate bats from birds? Yeah, so that's what something that people are working on right now. So that's difficult. So it's more difficult than separating birds from insects, for example, because of their flight speeds are very similar. Um, there are groups in the U.S., for example, that are really working on, because bats have a very different type of reflectivity due to their wings, to, tr to try and use that kind of information to separate them. Um, in, er in Europe, we have less of a problem with bats than we do in, uh, in North America, for example. I was so thinking from the perspective of being able to follow the migratory species and learn yeah. Yeah, so there's um, something I didn't, it's, it's rather technical, but you have different types of radar. So you have dual pole radar, which provides extra information on the shape <coughs> of the reflection, so that's mainly Body, body shape, and there's a lot that's actually very promising for separating bats and birds. 
Oh, okay, one more question and then we have to finish. Thank you. About a year or so, I, I was asking um, the, this sort of data from the British Meteorological Office. Yeah. And I got an answer that was that they'd already filtered out the biological Yeah, stuff they do, they yes. No, not oh, for the UK. Okay. Yeah. No, so that's <laughs> one of the problems. That's one of the problems that we're dealing with is that um, meteorological institutes actually make their own decisions. So the Netherlands has been working us, with us for a long time, so they store raw data. Right. The UK has been ignoring the ecologists for many years, so they throw it all out. So they filter the data and they store the filtered data only for yeah. this. So that's why you need a community to stamp it up and say, yeah, but we really need your raw data. Otherwise, you lose it. Talk. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now we have Francesca Mancini talking about making inferences about patterns in wildlife tourism activities in Scotland using social media. Hello everyone, uh, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Aberdeen and today this talk is going to be a part, uh, about a part of my PhD. So, um, oh no, here we go. Uh, tourism is a big industry in the UK, uh, it contributes 9% to the UK GDP and it generates 9% of the total of the UK jobs. Um, wildlife watching is a big part of this industry, in fact in Scotland it contributes £127 million per year to the economy, <coughs> so it's got huge socio-economic benefits, but uh, we now know that these activities can have impacts on the wildlife that they target. Uh, for example, this fruit bat is listed as endangered in the IUCN uh, Red List of Threatened Species, and one of its major threats is uh, the disturbance at the roost site disturbance that is caused by these, um, these tourism activities. So, and this is only one of uh, over 1,400 species that are listed as endangered or critically endangered. And uh, they have as one of their major threats uh, disturbance due to tourism. So we do need to be very careful about how we manage these activities. Otherwise, uh, they can affect the conservation status of, of the wildlife. Now, um, for example, it would be very useful to understand where tourists go, uh, because this way we can identify which areas are maybe receiving too much pressure from the tourism industry, and maybe they need to be prioritizing conservation actions. Uh, the problem with understanding the distribution of tourists is that we don't know where to get the data. Um, it's usually quite difficult to distinguish a specialized activity such as wildlife watching from general tourism. And we could use surveys, but they're usually quite expensive and they're also limited in coverage and in the resolution that they can get. So one of the solutions that has been proposed in the last couple of years is to use social media. Social media are a great source of information for a lot of things that concern the human behavior. And people have always taken pictures of their holidays. And now the widespread use of the internet and the popularity of smartphones and social media has made it even easier for people to take pictures of whatever they're doing and share it with the world. Flickr is a photo sharing website. It's been around since 2004, and uh, it allows you to attach a lot of information to the pictures that you're uploading. So for example, you can attach the uh, geographic coordinates of where the picture was taken, or the date when the picture was taken, and also all sorts of text uh, tags um, or descriptions about what is in the picture. So we don't actually have to look at them. So um, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that we do need to test whether this new data collection methodology is going to generate a good proxy for visitation. And we need to understand at which scale we can use it and at which resolution we can trust this data. Uh, and this is basically what we're going to do here. Uh, so um, we're going to test um, whether we can use Flickr uh, to generate a proxy for visitation using Scotland as a case study. The validation will be done in two parts. Um, we want to validate the temporal patterns of visitation that we estimate from Flickr, and then the spatial patterns. And at the end, we can ask what Flickr can tell us about wildlife watching in Scotland. Now, the only way I can think of doing, of doing this validation is by comparing what we get from Flickr to data sets that we obtain using more traditional methods, like surveys. And that's what we're doing here. So for the temporal validation, we obtain some data from the Cairngorms National Park Authority. And they were basically a time series of visitation to the Cairngorms National Park uh, between 2009 and 2014. And so we downloaded all the data associated with pictures that were uploaded on Flickr, taken in the Cairngorms National Park in the same period of time. Then for the spatial validation, we download all the data, uh, all the data associated with <coughs> pictures that were taken in Scotland between 2005 and 2015, and they were uploaded on Flickr. And then uh, we use keywords to only select those pictures that were relevant uh, to wildlife watching. So pictures of birds, seals, whales, and dolphins, which are basically the main groups of charismatic wildlife that people come to see in Scotland. 
And we use a subset of this data set and we compare it to data that we obtained from the Scottish Marine Recreation and Tourism Survey, which was a survey, an online survey that went around a year and a half ago. And uh, basically it was asking people to draw on a map of Scotland where they'd been in the previous 12 months uh, to conduct any wildlife watching activities. So for the temporal validation, so we compare these two time series uh, of visitation to the park, estimated from Flickr in blue, and, and uh, the ones that we obtained from the Kangos National Park Authority. And you can already see that they're quite similar, there's a strong seasonality. Uh, we also use a wavelet analysis, which is a spectral decomposition technique uh, that basically detects the significant oscillations in a time series. It also detects uh, this thing called wavelet coherency, which is basically a measure of how similar the oscillations of two time series are. And the bit that we're interested in is this big, big red bit uh, within the white lines, which basically represents the, um, the uh, significant cross correlation between the two time series. So I'm going to explain this graph. On the x axis, there is the time between 2009 and 2014. And on the y axis, there is the period or frequency of the oscillations, in this case, expressed in months. So basically, there is a significant cross correlation at a period of 12 months, which is basically these annual oscillations that are co correlated. Uh, the arrows uh, that you see in here um, represents the, how, how well the two uh, time series are synchronized, which uh, arrows pointing to the right mean that they are completely synchronized, which you can already see from there. So this is very good. Uh, now, um, for the spatial validation, we use three different grids uh, to test at which resolution uh, the data can be reliable. So 20, 10, and 5 kilometer, obviously, not to scale. And um, we counted uh, within each cell um, how many uh, unique Flickr users had taken a picture inside that cell, and how many survey respondents had indicated visiting that cell. And so we compare these two using GLMs. So the binomial GLMs were testing the hypothesis that the probability of finding a picture on Flickr that was taken in a particular cell was related to the number of uh, survey respondents that indicated visiting that cell. And negative binomial GLMs were used to test whether the number of unique Flickr users that took a picture inside the cell was related to the number of survey respondents that indicated visiting that cell. And we accounted for spatial autocorrelation issues. So these are the results from spatial validation. The three sets of graphs represent the three different spatial resolutions. The graphs on your left are the uh, results of the binomial GLMs. So you can see quite a strong relationship between the probability of finding a picture on Flickr and the number of survey respondents that indicated visiting that cell at a 20 and 10 kilometer resolution. But this relationship is still significant, statistically significant at the five kilometer resolution. And then the graphs on the right are the, negative, the results of the negative binomial GLMs that indicate basically the relationship between the number of Flickr users that uh, took a picture inside a cell and the number of survey respondents that visited that cell. And there is a strong relation, positive relationship at the 20 and 10 kilometer resolution, but it disappears at the five kilometer one. So we do need to be very careful when we're using this data to um, uh, infer fine scale movement of people for recreation, obviously. So um, now we can ask what, um, what Flickr can tell us about wildlife watching in Scotland. For time constraints, I'm only gonna uh, present two of the three data sets. This first one is about seal watching in Scotland. So these are density maps of the pictures of seals uh, that were uploaded on Flickr and taken in Scotland. Now uh, we can see basically big hotspots of visitation of seal watching on the west coast of Scotland, uh, Orkneys and uh, Shetland and Orkneys, uh, the Moray Firth and also the Firth of Forth. Uh, we can also see the birth of a hotspot, which is quite cool. Uh, from 2008, uh, there is a new area appearing on the map, which corresponds to Nubra, just north of Aberdeen. This site has become incredibly important for the seals and now <coughs> holds 26% of the grey seal population on the east coast of Scotland. And as a consequence, it has become very, very popular with the tourists. Um, this is uh, the whale and dolphin watching in Scotland. Uh, there's not a lot of data in this data set, but you can see a quite uh, um, consistent hotspot of dolphin watching in the Moray Firth, which is Channery Point. Channery Point is a place on the beach where you can very easily see dolphins from land, and it's become very, very busy. Uh, also, this data set shows the birth of a hotspot. From 2013, there is Aberdeen appearing on the maps, 
And 2013 is not the year when the dolphins appear. They've been there long before. 2013 is the year when the RSPB launched the dolphin watching event <laughs> from Aberdeen Harbour, mm -hmm. which is another indication that these data sets are capturing movement of people for wildlife watching purposes, which is good. So now, uh, there are some biases and some limitations that we need to be aware of when using this data collection methodology. So first of all, uh, there is a bias in Flickr. So um, <coughs> the highly populated areas will have higher number of Flickr users. So you're going to have lots of pictures there. Uh, then there is a limit uh, of the, for the resolution that we can use this data at. Uh, and we detected a 10 kilometer resolution uh, limit. Also, there is a problem that I call photographability of different species. Uh, so it can be quite easy to take a picture of a bird or seals, but it can be quite tricky to take a picture <laughs> of a dolphin. So we need to be quite careful when we're trying to use when we're using this data to compare volume of tourism uh, dedicated to different species. Um, however, after all these biases and limitations, the good news is that the uh, temporal patterns of visitation that we estimate from Flickr are quite similar to temporal patterns that we get from more traditionally uh, collected data sets. Uh, also, the spatial patterns of distribution of, of, of the Flickr pictures seem to be quite a good proxy for real visitation. And also, the hotspots maps are revealing some well-known uh, wildlife watching locations and some uh, uh, realistic temporal trends. <coughs> so, uh, now what we can do with this data is try and understand this distribution of the tourists. Why are they going where they're going? Is it because it's easy to get there, because there's lots of infrastructure? Or are they going there because there are things that they value in the wildlife? So, um, and all this information on tourist behavior is going to be very important to answer the question of whether wildlife watching tourism in Scotland is sustainable or not. And just wanted to thank all my Aww. supervisors <laughs> and funders. And uh, this is the link to the preprint on BioArchive, by the way, if you want to know more. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from, for Francesca? Uh, two questions, if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, the first question is, well, while in the third of you see Twitter, mm -hmm. which will already have geographic images, yeah. when people obviously activate the function and fix that. And uh, also, the special analysis, you're really looking at hot spots, it's there is when you're looking at cold spots. Okay. Of images. Uh, as it, Sorry. Is there any reason why you're just looking at hot spots and not cold spots as well? Um, in order to understand yeah. how they evolve sometimes. I'm looking at hot spots just because I want to identify those areas that are possibly receiving too much pressure from the from tourism. So it, it was just to uh, try and understand the distribution of the wildlife watchers in Scotland. But yeah, you could look at cold hotspots and maybe why people are not going there. Yeah. And what about the tweeters? Why don't you use the, your reference images in future? Even though you yeah. like good API style reference mm -hmm. images. So. Yeah, 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 you could use that. Uh, the main reason to use Flickr is that it's very easy to get the data from Flickr um, because the API is very well um, organized and it's very easy to communicate with the API with, within R. And also because of the picture, um, it, it's, it's very much con a, a, a social media about pictures. So pictures, really taking pictures was strictly related to, uh, to wildlife watching. A lot of wildlife watchers lo like to take pictures of the wildlife they're, they, they're watching. So that was the main reason. But yeah, definitely Twitter. Uh, we are doing some work with Twitter and in terms of um, the value of zoos for, for conservation attitudes and values. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one question here. Oh. Yes. So I, I was curious, do you know anything about the demography of, uh, of your Flickr users? Yeah. So you probably have a certain part of the public that's really using Flickr. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so usually it's uh, young and well-educated yeah. people that use Flickr the most. So yeah, there is definitely a bias, a bias in like the Flickr users. Uh, but that's true also for yeah. surveys, for exactly. example. Yeah. Online surveys will only have a certain um, yeah, audience. Do you think they're complementary though? Because probably you have older audiences that use Flickr social media? It depends on how the survey was designed because um, if it's online, uh, for example, that one was uh, basically advertised on Facebook a lot. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. again, you've got the same kind of audience. But yeah. it was advertised through emails as well. Uh, but again, only people that use, um, they are online quite often yeah. will get it. Uh, um, but yeah. One more question there and then we yeah. go um, to the next. Just looking at your temporal trends, yeah. Um, the simple explanation, the simple uh, 
view from the flicker is that it's increasing, yeah. but increasing rather than tourism. Yeah. Is that likely to level off? Is it likely to change? The popularity of Flickr has already changed. Yeah. It's already going down and Instagram is going up. But we did test, we did notice some differences in annual trends. And we tested, uh, we took basically, there is a huge data set of 100 million <coughs> pictures from Flickr online, the free for everyone to use. And we tested whether that, the popularity, how many users uh, upload pictures on Flickr was having a bigger effect than actual, the, the, the Cambridge National Park Authority time series on our time series. And it was really not having any effect at all. So, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be. I think we don't have any more time for this talk at all. Thank Francesca you. Later. Thank you. Now we have Gazine. Gazine Pufal is going to take a talk to us about mountain bikes as sea dispersers and their potential socio-ecological consequences for uh, filling up room. <laughs> it's getting very busy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm actually just presenting the study, and I, may not, I might not be the best person for that. I'll just show you the pictures of my <laughs> co-authors. Okay. This is the first author. <laughs> that will be the second author, and that's me. <laughs> Notice the absence of mountain bikes. I don't ride mountain bikes. I find them very scary. And the study actually happened that um, the bachelor students at our university, they have the opportunity to develop own projects. <coughs> and Fabio, the first author, came to me and he said, I wanted to do something with mountain bikes. I'm really interested in seed dispersal, so it was a match made in heaven, <laughs> and ended in a publication for a bachelor student, which I think is really nice. Okay, and this is Tyler in New Zealand, and they actually happened, they actually met, so Fabio and Tyler met in person, go mountain biking in New Zealand. I wasn't involved, <laughs> but um, he was really integral in the statistics part. But on to the talk. Seed dispersal. I don't think I have to explain seed dispersal, but what is really interesting is that seed dispersal depends on the traits of the seeds. So small and light seeds can easily be picked up. There are seeds that um, they can float on the wind because they have wings or appendages. Some have really sticky spines, so they stick to animals. And so shape is important, size and weight. And they can also de um, depend on the seed um, dispersers, or we call them seed vectors, or here you have two of them, and I'm really happy that in the first talk we had a picture of ducks where it was where it said um, seed dispersal. So this is kind of nice. Sheep can disperse seeds in their wool, lots and lots of seeds, hundreds of different species. <coughs> but humans can also be seed disperser. Once in the capacity of just being a mammal, maybe by eating something, excreting the seeds, but also things that stick to our clothes. So seed dispersal can by humans can happen as our capacity as mammal, but also in the last, um, let's say, two centuries, with vehicles that we have, centuries not so much the cars, but before that was carriages, but also horses and sheep that are being moved by humans. So sheep wouldn't normally go into this paddock on their own, someone gets them there. So that would be an indirect human dispersal. But the biggest dispersal that we now have by humans is with vehicles. So you have cars, trains, ships is a huge problem with seeds. And here we just have the, it oh, doesn't show up. <laughs> here we have the distances. So wind dispersed seeds, they can go on a landscape sail. It could be up to a few thousand kilometers. If they catch the right wind and if they're high enough and light enough, seeds can really be dispersed by wind quite far. Slugs, um, not so much. 10, 15 meters maybe, <laughs> um, and the same mammals, and that includes horses, sheep, um, what else, donkeys, so they can go quite far. Clothing has two different bars, as you can see, um, because you have your clothes, and then you might drop your seeds <coughs> from your socks or your trousers that you picked up during hiking, but if you combine it with other vectors, you might have your seed on your sock, you get into your car, you drive a few hundred kilometers, get out, and there you lose your seed, same with shoes and then cars, seeds can just stick to tires or different parts of the cars. And there are two ways of um, things that happen, or bad things that happen with um, seed dispersal by humans. We can spread unwanted species, usually non-native species. So we transport them with airplanes and ships to new locations and there they, they can spread along roads. So this is an invasive weed in Germany spread all along the autobahn lots and lots of very fast cars, you have the wind turbulences and they just 
spread along those roads. It's really interesting when you look at the spread of invasive species or non-native species, usually along roads. And then they can also spread to protected areas. So an autobahn is usually not a protected area, but hiking areas are. And this way you have your hikers, it's a bit better quality, with burrs, for example, sticking to your socks and your shoes. So you might take invasive or non-native species into very protected and sensitive areas. And the question that we have, because you use mountain bikes sometimes in protected areas, mountain bikers like to use trails in protected areas or beautiful areas. They create so-called social trails. They're called social trails by mountain bikers, illegal trails by conservationists. <laughs> <laughs> um, can they act as seed dispersal vectors? And what we wanted to find out is how far can they transport the seeds? What are the traits that are really important if you want to be dispersed by a mountain bike? And how does the behavior of the rider actually influence the seed dispersal? And we used five different seed species. They're native, so we use native species in our forest just in case we disperse a lot. And we actually put them in the oven before so they shouldn't be able to germinate. <laughs> and they're colored, so that it's bright pink pigment, so you can actually see the seeds. And there you have the seeds up there, different traits, different weights. And this is what the experimental area looked like. So we have these seeds spread out completely. And this is Fabio riding his mountain bike. He always used the same speed. <laughs> um, he went through there and then he checked the tires of his bike right after he went through there to just see what he initially picked up and then after 5, 10, 20, 50 and so forth up to 500 meters and we used different weather conditions we used wet weather conditions right after rain semi-wet is it's dry but we still have some puddles he recreated the puddles by spraying the ground we did initial tries in dry weather condition and we didn't pick up anything so we if you're riding your mountain bike in dry weather conditions, you should be fine. Um, this is the amount of seeds that he spread out. So he calculated the, his weight and the size of the tires. So he could calculate the amount of seed he could potentially pick up. And then we did a survey with um, quite a low number of participants, only 65, but they're all mountain bike freaks. <laughs> um, we picked them, so they went out to this mountain bike festival and um, just asked them about their habits, where do they ride, how long are the rides, do they clean their bikes, and it's actually quite hard to get information from them because mountain bikers are bashed by conservationists, you have these illegal trails, erosion, but Fabio being a mountain biker, for him it wasn't that hard to get the information, but for me it would have been impossible. Okay, we'll skip this one because that's wrong. Here we have... Um, the results, I don't know if you can see it from the back. We have the different weights of the species. So we had seeds that were on average two grams per thousand seed up to 35, so quite big seeds. And the information that you should take from this is that lighter seeds attach more to the tires and they detach after longer distances. So this is the initial attachment. This is the lightest seed. So from the thousands, I think it was yeah, several ten thousands of seeds you would pick up maybe 15% of the light seeds by going through the seed dispersal area. But they detach very quickly. So after 20 meters, you only have a fraction of that left. But even after 500 meters in semi-wet conditions, so dry with a puddle, there's a few seeds still in the tire. So they lodge in the profile of the tire. But when it's wet, you pick up a few, but you lose them really quickly. So there's hardly anything left after a few hundred meters. It um, looks interesting. It roughly translates to we have a few thousand seeds and in the end we transport maybe 10 or 20 but one seed might be enough just keep that in mind but then we have the seeds that don't attach to the tire but all sorts of different parts of the bike so you have the tire ones and you can see the bright pink quite nicely there was one lodged under the seat <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what this part is and then between the ears <laughs> and they stay there forever so he actually didn't count every little seed that he found after 5, 10, 20 or so forth meters. But after, after every end of the experimental run, he checked the entire bike. And I think over the many, many runs he did, there was a total of between 20 and 30 seeds that um, attached to the different parts of the bike and they actually stayed there. Also light seeds. So the heavy seeds just didn't stay there for long. So they could potentially stay there forever. And if you now combine that with the rider's preferences, then you get quite a nice picture of what might happen to the seeds that actually stay on the bike for longer. 
So the rides that some riders do are between 10 and 90 kilometers, on average 70 kilometers for two and a half rides, there we go. They clean on average every two and a half rides because they like to ride in wet conditions, the bike gets really muddy, you have to clean it. So potentially the bike only gets cleaned after being moved around for 70 plus kilometers. So the seat has the potential on st for staying on the bike for that long. And they use um, a variety of landscapes. And what I find quite interesting, when they go uphill, they use roads, forest roads. But when they go downhill, they use the social trails, the illegal trails. So they go right through the vegetation, downhill. Uphill roads where you pick up seeds, and then you lose them on the way down. So this is the graph from before. And this is where we can actually put the mountain bikes. So they do sort of similar, just on the tires, similar dispersal um, to mammals, a few hundred meters on the tires. But with other bike parts, we move into the dispersal on a regional and almost um, biogeographical scale. Um, if you ride your bike, let's say, in the Black Forest, put it on a plane, and then get out somewhere else, you might have transported seats a few thousand kilometers. But usually when you go through customs, they make you clean your bike, so you should be OK. So what does that mean? The advantageous seat plates <coughs> are light seats with flat <coughs> needle-like shapes. The flat seats really stick to the tires. The needles can get into the profile and just stay there. Something like this, and this could be a good or a bad seat. It's not only non-native species that have light or needle-like shapes. It's also native species. So it's good or bad, depends on your perspective. And this is a sign from New Zealand, so they are already aware of that in New Zealand, where if you go mountain biking at the trailheads, they make you aware, please clean your bike <coughs> so you don't, don't transport <coughs> any unwanted weeds. So you could transport unwanted weeds into sensitive areas, and you can just not do that by cleaning your bike. But there might also be transport of rare species or native species that have lost their dispersal ability because they have such fragmented habitats you might aid them in dispersing between the habitats. If you ride between grasslands and disperse beautiful grassland flowers, that's a good thing. So the next step would be, we actually don't know what mountain bikes transport. So we're working on a <coughs> master's project, hopefully <coughs> with the same students next year, to actually get information of what bikes transport. So you scrape off the mud from your bikes, let the seeds germinate and see what's in there. If you're interested in participating, email me so we get a good data set maybe from across the world. Um, yeah, just email me if you're interested in learning about more and participating. And just the take home message, on your tires you can transport seats for a few hundred meters, but on other bike parts you have the potential to transport them a lot more or a lot longer distances. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. <laughs> That was really interesting. I never thought of the mountain bikes as such. <laughs> so please, questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, we heard a talk yesterday about uh, seed dispersal through birds, which was very interesting. And the point was that um, a lot of people, when they do modeling of these things, they don't take that into account because they're not seeds that are known to be dispersed by exactly. animals. Exactly. Is that, does that in happen, not particularly with mountain bikes, but even all the, the clothing yeah, problem? Yeah, definitely. Uh, people not take that into account? Because yeah. when plants develop their seed dispersal mechanisms, they there's a bit of co-adaptation or co-evolution co going around with your uh, yeah. respective seed disperser. Yeah. We only had cars for the last 100 and something years. I don't think plants adapted to, there might be a car or a sock that can transport me. Yeah. So you have seeds that are usually dispersed by something else. We had wind dispersed seeds in here or just seeds that were dispersed by gravity. Yeah. So it could be anything. Please. Really interesting talk. Um, have you looked at other things like um, sort of pathogens like ash blowback and things like that? So I know in the, in the UK it's sort of like certain kind of trail centers and the people mountain bikers kind of growing awareness that cleaning bike is good for um, removing pathogens. Um, We've just started on that, so not really. Uh, as, please. Um, as, a, as a long distance cyclist, I'd be really interested in if then if you're using road bikes and then you're traveling you know, hundreds of, of miles, do you have the same seat traction as well because obviously the tires are very different. We actually tried two different sets of tires and we didn't feel quite similar in the first place but because I think both road bike tires are quite sleek right yeah. 
So um, maybe not. And you don't tend to go through much, right? No, yeah, you're on your so, own. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess most road bikes don't have that much of a, a potential to disperse seats, but maybe on different parts of the road bike as well. Because you're going to be traveling so much further. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but there, there is another genre of mountain biking which involves long distance through protected areas. So that would, if you just focus on trail areas, you'll be getting quite a biased set of mountain bikers, yeah. not some of the ones that are doing kind of 500 kilometer trips around the world. It's really hard to get the data, and yeah. they actually, when we started the paper, we had quite a few press releases, and we got a lot of backlash from mountain bikers because they were portrayed portrayed in the press as the bad guys again, because they, yeah, it's it's quite a difficult topic, but really interesting. Thank you. We need to start Thank with you. the next talk, Fiona Matthews, <laughs> our first properly dressed speaker of today, <laughs> talking about bats. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's Wednesday. We've been here a long time, right? <laughs> okay. Bats and wind turbines. Right. Question for you. What have these got in common? Okay. <laughs> Ask to the audience. Come on. What's that? He doesn't like wind turbines. Doesn't like wind turbines. Okay. That was the dull answer. <laughs> He's also a climate change denier. I don't think the polar bears have a problem with wind turbines, quite honestly. <laughs> and if we see what he says, do, how do I make that play? On the yeah, I click it there. See if this works. There's a brilliant she one. She wants to put the miners out of business, the mines out of business. Hang on. She wants to put natural gas out of business. She wants to put... It's going to be a disaster. Right, First disaster. of all, mm. the alternative is so expensive. It's so expensive. And honestly, it's not working so good. I know a lot about solar. I love solar. But the payback is, what, 18 years? Oh, great. Let me do it. 18 years. The wind kills all your birds. All your birds. <laughs> all your birds. All you know, your the birds. environmentalists never talk about that. Huh? And I wouldn't exactly say it makes your farmlands look beautiful. you got all these windmills all over the place going, driving you loco when you look at them, right? The worst farms are the ones where each windmill is made by a different company. So you'll have like 50 of them. And you have all these different companies. You have different colors, different shapes, different sizes. <laughs> Looks like a junkyard. All right, and let's stop, say, stop, oh, stop, yeah. stop, 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 stop. <laughs> you know what? Everything has its place. Solar absolutely has its uh, place. I think solar... I can't stop it. It's it's you, have to, you have to get out of your presentation. You have to do a tab. Uh, get out of your presentation. Exactly. Oh, it's okay. And then just go back in. So yeah. how do you make it present on the... Uh, you have to do a tab thing next time. Uh, what do okay. you back? No, you're no. back. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're not back. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, you were okay. Okay, <laughs> you're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Fine. Right. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Right. Okay. So, the kill all your birds, right? Well, perhaps not all your birds, but there has been an established problem that's been known about for some time of birds colliding with wind turbines, particularly uh, the birds <coughs> of prey, and it's caused a lot of concern it, particularly in North America, this is Altamont Pass in North America, which is one of the, well, not only one of the biggest wind energy installations, but one of the best studied. And it was actually first in North America that gradually people started noticing that occasionally they'd come across bats under wind turbines as well. And across Europe, we've been collecting data for a number of years on numbers of bat casualties found at wind farms, and these are the countries across the top and species down the side. Okay, so by 2009, we got about 2,000 um, wind turbine casualties. Britain's doing fine, though. We've only got 10, whereas, oh dear, Germany's doing really badly because they've got 1,000. Okay, actually, that's all to do with survey effort. The Germans were far more efficient than we were, obviously, and <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't have a problem. The total numbers now are about 7,000 reported incidents to Eurobats. Okay, so uh, a consortium got together to put together some funding and create a steering group for a big project on a national scale to try and assess this problem. And essentially what we were tasked with is to find out, are bats killed at wind turbines? And if yes, what species and how many within reasonable confidence intervals? Okay, so we set up a, a project which had two arms. The first was focused on large wind turbines. That's sites that have at least five individual turbines. 
We looked at 46 sites across the UK that we used a stratified random selection, although we were random in as far as we selected the order randomly and then went through trying to get permission from owners and operators. And in fairness, after a bit of a sticky start, you know, we've been incredibly grateful to the industry for working with us, because frankly they could all say no, pee off what's it got to do <laughs> with us. Um, we ended up serving about a quarter of all eligible sites and we used a study method where basically we're taking a snapshot, so we go for a month to a site and then move on to the next one. The reason for that is that whilst temporal trends and so on would be very interesting, our primary question was just to find out, okay, are bats being killed at all? We also had a second study, this is a case studentship, looking at small to medium wind where we've just got single turbines, okay? And we looked at 31 sites for that in the southwest. So we can't show you exactly where the wind facilities were that we studied because of confidentiality, but what I can show you is this figure shows you the highest density hotspots of wind turbines in the UK, and that's our study distribution. So actually, the place where we failed really was around the, the Pennines, Manchester area where we just couldn't get permissions to get on site. How do you survey at wind turbine sites? Well, the answer is with difficulty. <laughs> so the first thing you need to, to do is recruit the technicians who work in the wind, uh, actually in the turbines, to hopefully take your bat detectors up for you. And they did. They basically poke the microphone out of a suitable orifice. You can see it there under a winch hatch. And we're listening to bat activity. Okay. Finding bats, though, at wind turbine sites is incredibly challenging. I manage to lose bats in my own house when people give them to me to look after, and it takes me two days until I find them behind the curtain. So when we thought, OK, we've got moorland, we've got ploughed fields, how on earth are we going to do this? Well, our solution was uh, to try sniffer dogs. And actually, when I phoned up a guy who was kind of a friend of a friend, he was a police dog trainer, he killed himself laughing and said, I'm really sorry and I'm not meaning to be rude, but normally I'm looking for disappeared people in Northern Ireland and you're asking me to find bats, you know, what is all this? But anyway, right, I now need to know how to make this place so you can see it. So what do I have to do? Oh, you have a video? No, no. It's a video, so yeah. you know. No, but if it's Im is it embedded? If it's embedded, it'll play. Oh, will so it? Will it? If it I just yeah. click on it, it'll work? Yeah. You oh, know okay. what, you two? Ah. Try it, yeah. Because I've seen it in the folder, so it's uploaded yeah. on the main you can folder. Escape if you escape. The oh, oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is actually quite hard to video because the dogs get distracted by people standing next to them. So this was this is a, the trainer, and basically the dog needs to be working into the wind, and it's basically working on the scent. And in a minute, you'll see. Um, the dog gets the scent of the bat and turns around. The bat is kind of down here somewhere. You can work them on a lead. Um, they work better off the lead because they're a bit more motivated to run around. But you can work them on a lead if you have to. that video but it we can use it in habitat like this as well dogs aren't absolute magicians you know they have limitations just as we are but nevertheless it's in a promising technique so how do we show it's a good valid technique to use well what you do is you get some willing or unwilling victims namely your students at the time those of you from CEH will see that's Tom August and what you do is you make them do a comparison with dogs so we set up an experimental design around a wind turbine where we put um, <coughs> randomly placed bats and the observers didn't know how many. The humans walk up and down, the dogs hurtle around happily, people moan and take about two and a half hours to do it and you have to give them chocolate and things. The dogs just like to play with a ball and can do it in three quarters of an hour. <laughs> okay, so we did lots of trials and you can either do a GLMM if you want to or you can kind of see the bleeding obvious, which is dogs are better than we are. Okay, we use that to inform monitoring. Right, how do we actually find our dead bats? Well, these are our real wind, wind farms, if you like. 
we went out and we surveyed six sites, six turbines at every uh, wind farm for dead bats. We also did acoustic surveys at Nacelle, that's up in the hub and at the ground in three of them. And we had some controls as well and we walked to transit. Okay. Did we find bats? Well, yes, we did. And the range of species is similar to that found in elsewhere in Europe. So basically we've got a predominance of the more common species, so common soprano pipistrels, Nathusius pipistrel, which I'll come back to in a minute, and noctule. If you want to know how many bats, well the, the press went a bit bonkers a couple <laughs> of weeks ago and they came up with all sorts of headlines like wind farms could be killing 80,000 bats a year scientists find or <laughs> 200, pounds, 200 bats a month. And, you know, I don't think you need to know much about statistics to know those numbers can't possibly <laughs> add up. And the reality is that we tried really hard not to give a single number to the press, and the reason is that the numbers are hugely variable, huge amounts of variability between sites. We had about a third of sites with nothing found, but other sites, this is numbers of bats per turbine, it's just separated between the single wind turbine sites and the rest. But going up to maybe five bats a month, reasonable number are killing two bats per turbine per month. You know, if you've got big sites, this means big numbers of bats, but also quite a lot where we're finding relatively little, okay? So what are we doing now? Well, we're trying to contribute to new <coughs> guidance so that practitioners are gonna know what to do about this problem. What are we gonna tell them that they have to change? Well, unfortunately, it seems quite hard to know in advance which sites are a problem. Surprisingly, bat activity was a pretty poor predictor of fatality rates, uh, their habitat, there's some associations, but uh, you know, we've been talking to lots of people about this. The problem is you can draw a regression line, which means something to us as scientists. For a practitioner wanting to know about an individual site, the predictive power is really poor. We do know that as your numbers of turbines increase, your casualty rates increase, so you know, more turbines equals more dead bats, and the bigger turbines also have more dead bats. And the final thing is links with weather. So most of our casualties, this is showing you the wind speed at ground level, and these are all our casualties, and they're all at lower wind speed. Probably because bats are more likely to be flying around wind turbines at low wind speed. Just going to come back to finish with the impacts on possible migratory species, so it's really fascinating to hear your talk. Until very recently, we knew that a lot of bats in North America were being killed on migration. But this was not considered to be a problem in the UK because we don't have migratory bats. We're an island, aren't we? And otherwise we'd be full of rabies. <laughs> well, actually, it seems that maybe we do have at least bats that move in, whether it's a migratory migration backwards and forwards, we don't know. I've been doing with the Bat Conservation Trust a study with volunteers where we've been trapping pipistrels, taking fur samples, <coughs> looking at stable isotope profiles. This is, it had to be a really zoomed out picture because the UK here, and what you should be able to see is at least some of these dots are in colours looking at hydrogen and oxygen profiles. This is colours that seem to come from right over here. Which, in the first instance, I think this is mad. It's a tiny bat. It can't be going that far. But then, two Christmases ago, Christmas Eve, I was wrapping my presents, saw a message on Facebook, does anybody recognise this ring number? And I thought, I think that's one of mine. And actually, it was people working under my licence around Bristol about a big bat in Holland which is the first time we'd recorded intercontinental movement. But then this year, lots of exciting stuff. So we had this bat coming from Latvia being caught at Rye and another one in Lithia Lithuania. And these are really movements that are happening within a period of weeks. Okay? So we've done a little bit of modelling, of looking. Uh, we obviously don't know the exact flight routes, but we said, OK, if we've got these might be potential flight routes to the UK, What's your probability, if you take any of these routes, of encountering an offshore wind farm? Forgetting about all the millions along the coast going up to Latvia. And it turns out that actually you've got a damn good chance of encountering a wind farm. These are currently active uh, offshore wind farms. These are the ones under construction, and those are the ones that have got consent as well. So I think offshore is a big concern. I think the difficulty at the moment is that it's a feeling that it's out of sight, it's out of mind, we're not quite sure how to monitor it, and I'm finding it really hard to get it on the political agenda, because there's this bat and ball, who's responsible in the offshore environment? So that's my rant. 
I'll just finish by thanking <laughs> the very many people who've helped with this, field workers, PhD students, particularly Suzanne Richardson and Ali Moyle, Paul Lintart, some of you will have seen already, my postdoc, and Dave Hoskin. And that's it. Thank you. Aww. So maybe one a really, really quick question because we need to continue in 30 seconds, so... <laughs> yeah, so how important are these numbers in terms of the population? That's the million dollar question. And the absolutely honest answer is we know so little about that population dynamics that I've done sustainable harvesting models and the population can either be doing that or it can be carrying on perfectly fine. And that's a really, yeah, it's a really big problem. And it's the same if we want to, you know, understand the impact mm -hmm. of road collisions and all sorts of things. Yeah, so good um, point. Great, thank you. Now we have Kira Stafford talking about pen neotropical analysis of hunting preferences. That's really annoying. I was trying to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so good morning everyone. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some work that I've done as part of my PhD, which is about mammal hunting preferences in the Neotropics. Um, yes. So, um, hunting, in, um, hunting for bushmeat in the forests of Amazonia, of the Guiana Shield, and of Central America is something that's incredibly widespread and something that has a very long history. I mean, we're still talking about the size of the role that humans had in the extinction of the South American megafauna. And the sustainability of this sort of these sorts of activities is also still related. We're not sure at what scale it is sustainable. But what most people can agree on is that as human populations are increasing, as we are starting to encroach upon previously pristine habitat, and as once remote areas are starting to become way more accessible because we're building lots of roads throughout the Amazon, then hunting has the potential to be more of a conservation issue for some species than it currently is already. Um, so these are just some headlines that I've pulled the Guardian. This has all happened within the past five years or so, and we're also getting people starting to publish the impacts of these things are having. So it seemed like quite a good um, point in time to take a step back, have a look at how we know preferences vary across the continent. Um, so what do we know already? So uh, I'm in a community and I'm going to set off hunting. So the decision of whether to go for an animal or not is mainly going to be an economic decision. So I want to get the maximum amount of meat for um, the minimum amount of effort. Um, and this has been proven quite conclusively a lot across <coughs> lots of studies that this is the way in which people behave. Um, so this is a graph from a study that was published in 2003. Um, so along the bottom on the x-axis you have the body mass of different animals. Um, this is mammal, I think. Um, and along the top you have the selectivity index. So a value of minus one means that um, you're always going to avoid it, you just don't want to hunt that animal. Uh, a value of zero is that you're going to hunt it in proportion to its abundance. And a value of one means that you really, really like that animal. So as you can see, large bodied species are the preferred ones. So this means that we are going to expect all of our hunting profiles to be dominated by large animals, so tapirs, the acetylite monkeys, peccaries and brocket deer. And we're not going to expect to see lots of small animals, so things like squirrel monkeys and um, various types of rodent. However, it doesn't always work that way, and you can see that there are some kind of outliers here that aren't following the pattern that we'd expect. And that is because on top of this kind of mainly economic decision, we're going to have an influence of culture. Um, so two exceptions, just to give you some examples. Um, this isn't so much of a big deal now, but um, up until fairly recently, the last 50 years or so, Rocket deer were tabooed in certain um, communities in Ecuador, and that's because people, um, there was a belief that rocket deer were the spirits of um, ancestors. And we also have some rodents, especially packers, um, are really preferred because the meat is really tasty and there's a really good market for these sort of things at, um, for restaurants. Um, so if we have these kind of cultural influences <coughs> confounding these kind of nice patterns that you would expect, does that mean that? hunting preferences are a total mess or are there some factors some really easy to measure factors that we can look at that mean that we can predict what animals are going to be hunted in what numbers and you know it'd be really nice to have that for it because there are vast swathes of the amazon that have received very little attention so maybe if we know that we can predict what animals are hunted in what numbers by a very simple variable this could be something of quite large conservation value so first of all i'm going to talk to you about um just first to give you an overview about how they vary. Second of all, I'm going to look at whether um, these hunting profiles can be predicted by purely geography, just purely where it is. 
And secondly, I'm going to look at whether the age and size of settlements are things that are very easy to measure, can be used to predict hunting patterns. Uh, so for this, I needed some data. Um, so I went into the literature and I tried to look for hunting appetite profiles. And what I mean by that is just a list of what animals are hunted in what numbers. Um, so I managed to get data from 78 communities um, spread over 44 papers, which cover 10 different countries. Um, and you can see they're all the pins here. And this um, tree here is showing you all the different communities. Um, and it was done using hierarchical clustering. So the ones that are close together are close together geographically. And each sort of the color of the box indicates what country it's in. So I'm going to come back to this later. Um, so what do the preferences actually look like? Um, so pie chart heaven, pie chart enthusiasts. Um, so um, I split up the hunting um, lists into different orders. So let's take a little look at South, uh, Central America. There's the key. Um, so if you're not up to speed on your mammalian orders or if it's too far away for you to read, um, it's basically dominated by four or five orders. So um, in blue, we have the rodents. Uh, in red, we have cetartiodactyls, so that's peccaries and deer. Uh, in orange, we have cingulata, so that is armadillos. And in green, we have carnivores, which is almost just entirely um, coates. Um, you can also see that in a few communities down here, they like hunting primates. However, primates aren't anywhere near as prevalent way, as they are in South America. So as you can see, we have the usual suspects. We have the rodents and cetartiodactyls. But here, primates in yellow are a lot more prevalent. And we also have a couple of odd communities that like hunting uh, members of the order Pelosa. So that's anteaters and sloths that are supposed to really not taste nice. So that was quite surprising. Um, and we have a couple of communities that like hunting lagomorphs, so um, rabbits, essentially. Um, so just looking at that by eye, it looks like geography might be a really good predictor of what the hunting profile is going to look like. And that makes sense, right? Because uh, communities that are close together are going to have more cultural interchange, and they're also going to inhabit forests that have a similar starting productivity. So the animals are probably going to be replaced at similar rates. Um, so I tested this using a Mantel test. So what I did is I made two distance matrices. One is just based on how close each community is geographically, and one is based on how close each community is um, in terms of these pie jobs. Um, I then ran a Mantel test that looks for correlation between two distance matrices. Um, this was the result up here. So you can see I did get a significant result, which is really nice. But actually, if you look at the R squared, um, it's really small. So that's the R. So my R squared is like not point, not one. So almost not really worth talking about. Um, so thank you. Um, I had a little think about how best to show you this, and this is where the trees come back in. So. This is the tree that's based just on geographic distance, and this is the tree that is based on how similar their hunting profiles are. There are kind of some conserved differences. So up at the top, we have the Central American communities, and down at the back, we have the South American communities. But as you can see, all these nice color blocks have been completely jumbled up. So we have a community here that's in Central America, and it is hunting animals <coughs> in the same proportions as a community down in Bolivia. So it doesn't look like geography is very predictive. So let's look at something else. Um, maybe the age and size of communities um, can predict the way in which they hunt. So this isn't a new idea, it's been tested before. And the idea is that if you're a young or a small community, you still have good kind of um, populations of your preferred species, your tapirs, your ethylene monkeys. And then as you start hunting and these become rarer, you're going to have to do two things. So A, you're going to have to diversify your profile and go for mammals which you didn't really want to before. And secondly, these animals are going to be smaller. So that means that we have two hypotheses which you can test. And first of all is that older and larger settlements are going to hunt a wider variety of species. And secondly, that older or larger settlements are going to hunt smaller animals. Um, so as I said, this has, has been um, tested before. And they found some really nice results. So this is the same 2003 paper that I was quoting from earlier. Um, the age of settlement is along the x-axis, and the number of mammals is along the y-axis. And as you can see, after about as you might be able to see, after about 15 years, they start having to diversify the prey for them. Um, however, when I run the same analysis with my larger samples, the earn is 27, but there are only 24 points on that map, on that graph. Um, my N is 44, the, the pattern's gone. I get no diversification after 15 years. Um, and similarly, they found quite a nice sort of pattern that as the community got older, 
the mean body mass of the things that they were hunting was going down. They were hunting smaller animals. The R squared isn't massive, but it was significant. And again, when I run this with my largest data set, the relationship is gone. So what's going on? There are various different potential answers. I still don't know which one it is yet. Um, <coughs> so it could just be that age and size are really poor um, proxies for hunting pressure. And I think this is the most likely one. I haven't taken into account that the um, hunting catchments for different communities are different sizes, but this is really difficult data to get. So if I tried to get this for every single one, my sample size would have been about 10. Um, it could be that um, we do know that different areas of the neotropics um, have different productivity. So it could be that these are masking the effects of um, age and size. Um, or it could just be that there are cultural differences. And again, these are so big that it's masking any of these kind of nice clear effects that we would see. Um, so to conclude, I was a bit worried that this was kind of going to be a <laughs> conclusive summary of my results. So what can we, what can we take away that's concrete? So first of all, geography isn't a great predictor of what animals are going to be hunted in what numbers. So if you are a conservation organisation, you're going to go into, into a community that hasn't been studied before, then you can't just assume that it's going to do what its neighbour was doing or what a community in the same country was doing, and you're going to have to go in and start collecting data. Um, and secondly, that we probably need to stop using the age and size of settlements as good proxies of hunting pressure. And before we can start making these sorts of predictions of what the hunting pressure is, we need to have better, a better understanding. So, for example, get these kind of hunting catchment sizes and also, oh yeah, just the hunting catchment sizes. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Kira. Uh, we have quite a lot of time for questions, four minutes, so please start. <laughs> uh, a double question. Uh, a, did, did I get it right that you only looked at the current and not actually like the harvest the biomass, basically report the number of animals? Yes, it is the number of animals, which is what those pie charts are showing. If okay. I have done it with biomass as well. You basically get the same pattern. Um, you get Perissodactyls, so um, tapirs obviously start accounting for it much more than they used to, but um, the pattern is more or less the same. Perissodactyls are the only ones that really make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. And second, with the cultural differences, um, one uh, interesting idea while I have while listening to you um, is the do you know about like there's a map that maps basically the cultural diversity of languages in the Amazon in South I've America. And I've be been trying to get it. I've been looking everywhere. I can't find it. If anyone knows where it is, that would be incredible. Because then, sorry, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, <laughs> if you know, please tell me. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, I've seen some questions here. Yep. Yeah. So, so is your best predictor still the habitat? So, species distribution and abundance. Your best predictor of hunting. Um, for now? It's probably body size. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably body size. It just means that we, we can't very get very high definition. So the nuances of culture uh, don't show any patterns, really. So the best predictor is still the body size of an animal. And you're just going to yeah. have to go in with really, really specific local knowledge about the taboos. Yeah. Uh, we have a question there. Hi. Hi. Thanks very much for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, I was uh, interested in the evidence that you provided. Um, was there, did you come across in the literature relative abundance, so measures of relative abundance for the hunted species um, versus the, the rates of take that people were reporting in the literature? Because I would have expected that the rates at which people were taking a different tax uh, would have been put more closely related with the actual relative abundance of the species that were there. Yeah, um, so it is in some papers. Um, very few papers actually provide abundance data alongside their hunting profile. So it is something that I want to do. However, yeah, my sample size would be about eight and not 74. So yeah, it would be interesting. And it is obviously really important, but the data just isn't there. Yeah. 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 Is there any way that you can maybe relate how difficult it is to hunt some species? Because I can imagine getting a slot is a lot easier than getting some rodents that might be in the ground. So maybe just not body size, but other things like how easy is it to get the animal might be available? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I was just trying to think if, if, so, if some things are easier than others. I, ever since shotguns have arrived, everything is very easy to, <laughs> to harvest. You just go out lamping. 
and if, if it's there it's, it's going to be easy to get but y you do have things that you can catch passively so like the rodents you can just set snares so I guess yeah that would be interesting to have a look at that as well. And maybe one more question. Um, I was just wondering Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what the answer would be. I mean, so like, I have done the analyses at a really high taxonomic order, and that was because I wanted to make sure that there was an analog for something at every kind of different point. And obviously, when your geographical area is so enormous, you have to just kind of be like, oh, artidactyls at that level. Um, it would be interesting, and I'd quite like to make it really big matrix where it was kind of at a lower taxonomic scale and have a look at what that's like. But yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you, Fiora. Uh, now we have Tatiana Baricka on bikers. And can we eat them? Thank you. Um, so we are, we're now moving from Amazon to Sub-Saharan Africa, but we're carrying on with bushmeat harvesting. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about improving decisions in bushmeat harvesting in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so when harvesting wild animals through bushmeat, frequently not enough is known about the ecology of the exploited species. Thus, we frequently get our harvesting policies wrong with catastrophic consequences for the exploited species uh, and for the local communities that rely on the species for food and income. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about how to help decision makers uh, make uh, by, by in this really data poor world by firstly showing them the full range of likely outcomes for their chosen harvest rate. Secondly, by linking this harvest rate directly and explicitly with the extinction risks for the exploited species. And thirdly, by designing an interactive decision-making tool for policymakers with very little knowledge of species ecology. To do this, we compiled multiple studies of Dica, Dica antelope. Uh, then we formed a model to predict all likely population trajectories for dikers under harvesting and use this to select the harvest rate that uh, gives us the maximum yield. Finally, to decide whether this harvest rate is sustainable or not, we compare extinction risks or survival probab probabilities for species under harvesting. Uh, as you probably know, uh, more often than not, we don't know enough about the, uh, we don't know which empirical study gives us the best prediction uh, of, the, of species ecology. Uh, so, um, our approach is different, is that we make no assumptions about which empirical study to use. Uh, instead, the only assumption we make is that by combining multiple studies, we get better estimates than by using a single study. So here's our prediction uh, for sustainable harvest of Pista Pistosdaica, one of the most heavily hunted ungulate in sub-Saharan Africa. So if you if you can see the top lot, <laughs> uh, the y-axis is the average meat yields in animals per kilometer squared. On the x-axis is the harvest rate expressed as a percentage of population being extracted each year. And it goes from zero, so practically no, well, no harvest, to 0 0.9, or a whopping 90% of population extracted each year. <coughs> so this is a basically a, a classical Gordon Schaffer model, where, if you're not very familiar with the, with the model, uh, expected yields increase with harvest pressure initially. Uh, they peak at maximum sustainable yield, and then they decline again as over-harvesting drives species to extinction. Now, the peak of this, of this little curve, I realize it's very peaky, uh, but the peak of this curve is the, usually it's the maximum sustainable yield. However, in our case, 
it's actually the median or maximum sustainable yields based on multiple population trajectories for Peter's Dica under harvesting. So what we're saying is basically we combined all available knowledge for Peter's Dica, all studies that I could find, uh, and based on all this information, around 10% of Peter's Dica can be extra extracted sustainably each year. This equates to around a yield of, if you go right here, of around 0 0.6 animals per kilometer squared, uh, roughly 730 animals from a small sized, small sized forest, which is, to me, it was surprisingly low, actually, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you know how many animals are being extracted uh, from the same sized area in the tropics. Now, to the, second, to the first point I made, the, uh, the full ranges of outcome. Now, these gray areas here, actually, the 15 to 95 percent confidence intervals. And in our case, they actually show the range of possible meat yields at each harvest, harvest, uh, harvest rate. So just to explain as an example, uh, at our sustainable harvest rate of 0 0.1, we would expect an average a yield of around 0 0.6 animals per kilometer squared, but actually they can be anywhere between high, high bracket here, what about four animals, and low bracket here around 0 0.02 <coughs> animals. So the range is actually quite big, and we realize it's still a huge range. But our idea was to show, uh, the objective was to show this range very, very systematically. So a decision maker looking at this plot could see where he's at at each harvest rate. Um, also, importantly, now to the second point, the extinction risk. This second plot here is the survival probability with harvesting pressure. So, as you would expect, the harder you harvest, the higher the, higher the chance of extinction. And you, you can see survival probability goes down with, extinction, uh, with harvesting pressure. Now, these two plots are linked. So, for our harvest rate, uh, of 0 0.1, the recommended harvest rate. If you go down, you'll see the survival probability, probability is around 0 0.95 or 95 percent, which is still well, well above the 90 percent IUCN recommended threshold. Now, of course, this model has a limitation. I'm going to mention one at the end, but just bear with me for the time. This is the this is where we want to be eventually. Uh, now. A little bit about the methodology. Um, so this project began uh, about six months ago when I went to Oxford University to pitch the idea of land sparing <coughs> as a solution to, to, uh, to over-harvesting. Well, the idea didn't, didn't quite fly. Uh, <laughs> so um, we decided to look at uh, bushmeat <coughs> harvesting of daika antelope, and antelope instead. I went back and spent the next four months compiling primary studies for Dica cephalos species, there's three guys, particularly looking for primary studies of two population parameters, uh, maximum population growth rate and carrying capacity. Amazingly, uh, and luckily, I, will, I managed to find 11 studies. At that time, I was like, oh, 11 studies only, but as it turned out, it was actually not so bad. Uh, so 11 studies, which I then compiled in a data set, so these were my studies, they're all across Sub-Saharan Africa. They are compiled in a data set. Then we then used to estimate the averages for my two population parameters, and then the, the standard deviations. This, this, this estimates are then, um, uh, they, they, these averages form the basis of a very simple Bayesian framework where we assume that uh, our priors cluster around the averages estimated from the empirical data. We sample them uh, with, from log normal distribution, and then their samples are fed into a simple Gordon Schaffel model and outcome our predictions of sustainable harvesting. Now, to the results. Um, the uh, sustainable harvest rates for all our three species were actually surprisingly consistently low. Less than 5% of species could be harvested sustainably uh, for two out of three species. 
And this was actually uh, lower than some external, less conservative estimates of 13% for Blue Dyke, for instance. Uh, so by, by combining multiple studies, amazingly, we were actually able to narrow down uh, the predictions of sustainable harvest rate. Now, another, uh, another thing we thought about is, remember, the idea was to improve decision making in bushmeat harvesting. And if you imagine yourself as a decision maker for a second, how far ahead are you likely to look? 10, 20 years, perhaps? Uh, so the plot that I showed you originally with a, with a little hump here, uh, that was actually averaged yields over 100 years. And 100 years is a long, long time for a decision making, for a decision maker. If, so what happens if, you, if I decrease the number of years of harvest into something arguably more feasible in terms of decision making? So what happens is the plot profile here becomes more, well, much flatter. Uh, and the upshot of that, <coughs> the decision maker would struggle to find that optimum where the sustainable harvest rate is just about, the, the harvest rate is just about sustainable. So they may over harvest, not realize it, and carry on harvesting until it's too late. Uh, similarly, th this problem is actually compounded because the hunting techniques are becoming more efficient. So the yields may stay constant or maybe decline just a little bit but the population actually may be struggling. Uh, the second thing we thought is what happens with population growth rate, say because of climate change. I'm not sure how likely this is for dikers, but for other species perhaps. Um, strangely, we saw an increase uh, in harvest rate uh, exploitation rates at, um, at higher growth rates. So this is something we still, we still want to investigate a little bit further. Now, uh, the third thing that I mentioned is an interactive decision-making tool. I'm, just, I'm trying to show you very clearly what, what it looks like and that um, was originally pitched at decision-makers. Um, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back to Trump. <laughs> Uh, so it only requires input of two population parameters, population growth rate and carrying capacity. It's an online app hosted at Shiny Apps. Uh, and this is an interactive bit. You can actually vary population parameters here. Uh, and the, the, uh, the plot that I showed you originally actually update automatically. So one thing, the limitations, we, we realized this. Uh, Every time we ran <coughs> the model, the, the recommended policies were not 100% consistent between the runs. And that has to do with the uncertainty of the, in the model. Our population, the, the, the data is so limited, and certainties are huge. So um, a policymaker looking at this and trying this app um, would not get 100% consistent policy recommendations. And this is really, really confusing. Uh, however, one thing we notice is when we reduced uh, the number of the uncertainty by simply sliding the number of standard deviations, predictions, the recommendations became much more consistent between runs. And this suggests the value of extra studies. So presumably, the, 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 the more studies we have, the easier would, be, would it be to home onto the sustainable harvest strategy for the policy makers. Very slow. <laughs> <laughs> to get there eventually. Yay. Right. So um, just to summarize, uh, we set out with the idea of improving decisions in bushmeat harvesting. Uh, and we uh, uh, tackled it in three ways by developing an interactive decision making tool that can be used for scenario analysis, uh, by, by connecting uh, harvest rate explicitly with the survival risk. So you have got two linked things now to, make your de to base your decision on. And finally, by com compiling multiple studies, not just a single study, you get an idea of, of the range of outcomes, not just one of the possible outcomes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'll take some questions now. One quick question, please. Quick. Uh, 
really interesting talk. I, I love your use of the Shiny app. Um, <laughs> so my question is, is there a lot of variability across the, the species that you looked at in terms of their response, in terms of their, their RMAX, and the variability in carrying capacity? Because I would expect that would affect your recommendation and outcomes. For Peter's site, for the first guy that I showed you, we've only got four studies for carrying capacity. Variability is huge. Yeah. And also, surprising thing we saw, so again, for Peter's site, uh, the minimum of in the range from the empirical studies, right, was uh, that for the carrying capacity, it could be <coughs> two animals, and the maximum would be 70. So imagine between two and seven, so huge. So the, uh, the empirical studies actually report very different estimates, and that's another problem. But that's what we're trying to address, basically, find this um, golden golden spot. Um, but yeah, yes, to answer your question. Thank you very yeah. much, Tatiana. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Knight on the impact of environmental quality on subjective well-being. OK, thank you. So. What I realise now is that going to the end of the session is that you really need the toilet and do your presentation. <laughs> so you might be a bit manic. Apologies. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk about a bit of my PhD work, um, looking at how subjective well-being is impacted by environmental quality. Um, and my main questions that I'm going to discuss with you today are: What is the effect? Uh, what is the size of the effect? And how does it vary? And how does it compare with other determinants of well-being? And I'll discuss that in a bit. Um, and then also um, other demographics which are more influenced by, by this effect. So there are no animals or plants in my presentation. This is just pupa. <laughs> um, OK, so let me give this. this. So there are, I'm, I'm not going to delve into subjective well-being as um, <coughs> is, it a, is it a good measure of, of, um, to use in terms of objective me measures of well-being. That's, that's for, for something else. But um, it's, it's uh, been shown to be very robust against objective measures of well-being. And it's particularly um, topical at the moment. Um, there's lots of governments that are, uh, the government um, acts and um, projects that are looking at the determinants of well-being. Um, and uh, subjective well-being is being suggested as a kind of a new way of looking at um, progress and success of a nation. So it's, it's being used to look at whether um, it can replace GDP and things like that for looking at nation success. It's used really commonly in economic literature, um, certainly in psycho psychology literature, um, and there's more and more use now in environmental uh, studies. So um, looking to, so I asked myself, what are the determinants of, of well-being? How how do you, what does a person take into account when they rate their own well-being? So I'll say as well, subjective well-being is the kind of evaluative, ex experiential way that someone um, evaluates their life. Um, so what, what determines that? And there's no better place for information than the classy newspaper of the Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> so age is a key determinant of well-being. Um, apologies to anyone who's on the left side of this graph. You're on a multi-decade slump. Um, <laughs> anyone plus 46, you're, you're, you've got euphoria ahead of you. So, um, so age is one. Um, other relationships that are found are things like relationship, state, uh, relationship status, particularly happy relationships. Um, whether, whether it's married or not, um, things like employment status, um, um, having children, so having children doesn't actually improve your, your well-being. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, there's all kinds of things. It's, re it's really quite well, well known in, 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 in literature, these kind of individual level uh, determinants of well-being. Um, and so the Office of National Statistics uh, for the government, they uh, every year do a, a UK study of, um, of measuring well-being. And you get this kind of um, geographical <laughs> pattern here. So as well as the kind of individual level um, determinants, I was really interested in actually kind of spatially what, what, what determines those things. So I don't know if there's anybody from South Northamptonshire, but you guys are the giddiest amongst <laughs> them. Something's happening there. Um, so, 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 so what is it about this pattern as well that, that um, determines this and, and how can we measure it? So um, there's, there's literature um, at the moment, different types of um, natural environment determinants that look at this. Um, so really, really great work coming out of Exeter for uh, looking at green space and, and blue space. Um, different types of, of measures and um, I'm really interested in the clean air one, so looking at air pollution, how that, that influences um, someone's self uh, kind of evaluation of, of their life. So uh, is it a problem in the UK? Um, so the EU sets these exceedance levels um, every, every year 
and uh, the UK annually um, exceeds it. So there's these, ex uh, these, these illegal levels of air pollution uh, within the UK. Um, the UK government's recently been taken to, to court over this by, by an environmental charity. Um, so yeah, there's these regular um, exceedance levels, and s so this happens regularly in London. So this year, this was this was taken from uh, the news earlier on this year. Putney High Street exceeded the annual exceedance level within the first eight days of the year. <coughs> so anything after that is illegal. Last year, happened within four or five days um, on Oxford Street. They couldn't measure it this year because the sensor was broken, um, but it's, <laughs> it's likely to be the same. So these regular levels, but it's not just a London problem as well. It happens in other large urban areas, um, Hull, Portsmouth. So it's related basically to kind of traffic, traffic load. Um, so the main, the main kind of um, source of, of nitrogen dioxide, for example, is uh, diesel vehicles. Ports are big sources of this too. So you've got this illegal level of, of air pollution. Um, there's also the health, so there's the health burden associated with that. So um, across the world, it's estimated that 3.7 million premature deaths a year are associated to outdoor air pollution. Um, nine and a half uh, thousand of those are related to London alone. Um, so you've got this, you've got this illegal level, you've got this health burden of this. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, the Environment um, European Agency estimated that between 3.4 and 7.9 billion pounds were related, were spent on. Um, health and environmental damage purely related to industrial air pollution. I couldn't tease out traffic out that, but um, if you add in other sources such as traffic, um, agriculture, etc., it's going to be astronomical. So you've got this real economic incentive to, to tackle this too. So lots of studies, uh, they look at the kind of objective um, health measures. So lots of studies um, looking at kind of chronic respiratory uh, issues, chronic um, heart disease, things like this on air quality. And I'm really interested in the, the life satisfaction side of that, the, the, the subjective well-being impact of that as well, and how that then could feed in as evidence to these um, broader governmental programmes to explore determinants of well-being. So there's some, there's some literature, generally they find that there's a negative um, effect of, of air pollution on life satisfaction. Um, so, so there's lots of really great work out there, but I, uh, methodologically sometimes they're hindered by, by a number of things. Um, and this is where my data GIS background starts to go haywire. Um, so things like, um, low, uh, they can be hindered by low spatial resolution, um, studies being done at country level or at regional level. Um, also temporal resolutions, so lots of studies are just kind of snapshots across time, so they're cross-sectional, so they're done in one year, um, and the, the, which, is, which is great and it's really informative, but it does make um, inferring causality really hard. With that, so you can say there's a relation, but you can't actually infer that a change in uh, pollution it directly affects um, life satisfaction. <laughs> oh my god! Um, okay, and, and so, they're, uh, <laughs> so they're also hindered uh, potentially by um, unaccountable heterogeneity, so things like omitted variables. So it's really important to try to account for as many determinants of well-being as you can when trying to uh, isolate that effect. So that's where I have tried to come in. Um, so I'm using um, individual level well-being data and individual level um, socioeconomic data. I'm um, using Understanding Society data, which is a kind of follow-on from the British Household Panel Survey. Um, it's the largest UK, it's the largest household uh, panel survey in the world. Um, it basically asks the same people the same questions every year. So BHPS started in 1991, and the Understanding Society is still going on. So you get this this lovely kind of 26, 25 years already worth this lovely time series data. Um, and within that, they ask things about uh, well-being and other metrics. So I'm using that. Um, and the nice thing about using that is that um, they're asked um, questions without even knowing that you're going to then analyse it in the, in the frame of environmental impact. So there's a lot of bias there that that's omitted. Um, and then the, my, my geographical unit of study is LSOAs, the lowest super output areas. They're just UK administrative boundaries between 1,000 and 3,000 people within an LSOA. This is what um, they look like. So in rural, in rural areas, they're big. In urban areas, they're tiny. Um, so I use, I use the longitudinal nature of this data, um, which hopefully then um, can hopefully get closer towards inferring causality. So you're looking at the changes in the same person over time, so you're not looking across people anymore. Which then allows me to use fixed effects uh, regression. Uh, which kind of takes out all those things about people that don't change through time, so things like personality and experience, things like that, um, and try and use as many control variables as I can get my hands on. So this has basically been just a big data, big secondary data um, project, um, yeah, which is 
which has been great. So the question in our science society that I use is the wellbeing measure is overall how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? So life satisfaction um, has been shown to be quite a robust measure of uh, subjective wellbeing. So uh, just quickly, so this is what NO2 looks like um, over a year um, in England. I had to restrict my study down to England uh, due to all the other control variables <coughs> that I include. Lots of them, lots of governmental data is only available at the uh, to English level. Uh, so that's NO2. Um, so I use lots of the individual level control data from understanding society, so things about income, about age, about relationship status, those kinds of things. And then I use some um, neighbourhood level uh, control variables as well. So this is um, something called the uh, disease of multiple deprivation from a government department. All the red spaces are the most deprived um, and use measures of green space, um, population, density, water, things like that. Um, I don't know a way to make the regression results look sexy in a presentation, mm -hmm. so apologies about the table, but so I introduced stars just to kind of highlight the two main points that I want to show you. So the, what, basically what you're looking for from this approach is um, signif significance and the effect size and your standard errors. So um, the, basically this says that um, I got a significant result and that um, nitrogen dioxide, as it increases, um, it reduces um, life satisfaction. So a one unit, one microgram per meters cubed of nitrogen dioxide increase um, reduces life satisfaction on the Likert scale of one to seven by 0.003, which sounds, sounds tiny, right? That doesn't sound like much at all. Um, but when it's influencing uh, for about 50,000 people um, across a country, it's, that's, that's actually quite significant um, in, in terms of the, of the impact of that. To make it maybe a bit more um, meaningful, I standardised the coefficients, so then you're looking at standard deviation changes between everything, um, so you can kind of then start to compare the effect of, of this compared to other changes in your life, for example. So it's approximately half, half the effect size of becoming unemployed, say, so a standard deviation change in air pollution, which is about seven units or something like that. So that, that's, thank you, oh God. So that, 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 that's why, um, then that gives you more of a sense of what that means in, for, for the person. Um, so then, yeah, so I wanted then to look at, what, you know, is this just a linear effect or are there people that are particularly, particularly more affected, especially because lots of health literature shows that people already in poorer health um, are, are um, affected by this. I wanted to see whether you can see this in life satisfaction stuff. So I just put in an interaction um, term and just took everyone who's completely happy with their um, physical health well, uh, sorry, their health uh, broadly, um, and compared it to people who are less than completely satisfied with their health. And um, this shows that for people who are less than completely satisfied with their health, as pollution increases, <coughs> you get a larger impact on life satisfaction. So changes in air, increases in air pollution affect people in poorer health more. Um, so my key points, um, significant negative effect of um, air pollution on life satisfaction on adults in the UK. Um, my guess is it's to do with things like aesthetics, smell, uh, things like that. Um, and then there's greater effect on people with poorer health. Um, uh, uh, I, assume, um, I guess this is to do with vulnerabilities, multiple morbidities, things like this. Um, and that actually the methodology of this has been really great in terms of utilising all this lovely existing data that's out there and the depth the, 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 that they offer. Um, and actually we can actually begin to infer causality in this. Um, so what's next? Um, what does that mean for the diesel car in England? I know Sadiq Khan's doing lovely things with the congestion chart and trying to reduce uh, diesel vehicles and the age of them. So um, I, I think there'll be really interesting changes in that coming. Um, are there other indicators of poor environmental quality that I want to look at? So I'm starting to look at things like landfill sites, contaminated land. Um, does the same thing happen in reverse for good environmental quality? Um, so the previous studies show things like good quality green space, biodiverse areas have that impact. So I'm really interested to look further into that. Um, and then I want to then go and speak to these people in poor health and actually what is their experience um, with, with environmental quality, what the barriers. Um, so, thank you. Yep. Nitrous oxide pollution from population density and like land cover? 
Um, so it's, it's to do with the, the regression um, approach that you use. So that if you, you're basically, you're, you're trying to account when you're, you're kind of taking the mean of, of all of these. So you're saying, given all of these other things are constant, what is the effect between nitrogen dioxide and life satisfaction? By including things in the, in the regression, you're, you're kind of accounting for any variation that happens in there. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's in, it's in, the, in that approach, the fixed effects approach. Right, quick one, please. Uh, it would be interesting to see the effect of the possibility of watching wildlife in urban <laughs> areas. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, in the parks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I agree. Sorry, not a guess. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe we should go for the next talk so we're in time for lunch. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Chris Murray on reality by snake bite under global change. Interesting talk. topic, please. Thank you. Um, <coughs> forgive my hoarseness. It was a good, good party last night. Um, <coughs> so, uh, you know, who likes snakes? Every, surely everybody here likes snakes since you came for the talk. If you look at this picture, maybe a little bit less so. <laughs> <No>. <coughs> um, has anybody ever been bitten by a snake? Raise their hands. Wow, that's actually quite good. Okay. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've been attacked by birds. I've even been bitten by a frog, but I've never been bitten by a snake. Um, and I got interested in this, in this topic. I was at a conference last year in, in Spain on environmental change and, and disease. And uh, a, a guy that we were talking about neglected tropical diseases, and the guy stood up and he said, I think the most neglected tropical disease is snake bite. And I thought, wow, that's, I never thought of snake bite as a, as a tropical disease, but you know, it makes a lot of sense. So I started looking into it, and in, in, some, in some senses this talk's really about uh, you know, giving you sort of the first step of what will become now a sort of three-year project, which makes sense to me because I don't know anything about snake bite. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm keen to get some, some input. So if you have ideas, uh, let, let, let me know as, as, as we go through. Um, you'll probably see what I'm talking about a little bit more. Okay, so, uh, you know, snake bite. So many people in here have been bitten by snakes, it won't be surprising <laughs> to learn that something like five million people a year get bitten by snakes, um, which is a lot. Um, and about two something million get uh, envenomed, so that they actually get some kind of uh, you know, uh, poisoning from, from the venom of venomous snakes. And something like um, maybe 50 to 100,000 people die from, from snake bite every year. So if you look at this, uh, <coughs> this chart here, this sort of shows the sort of the, the incidence rate, which is the you know, number of people being bitten. And you can see that it's, it's a lot higher than some of the neglected tropical diseases that, that uh, you know, a lot of people know stuff about, lush mania, leprosy, um, Chagas disease, things like that. And so I, I sort of did a really quick and dirty literature analysis, looking at the sort of neglect, looking for evidence of neglect of this snake bite issue. Um, and that's summarized in these three charts here. So the first thing I did was look at the sort of number of publications on snake bite versus 10 or 11 other neglected tropical diseases, which are listed here. Um, and snake bite's in yellow, so you can see that there's been sort of basically minimal on to no attention for ever, and that hasn't really changed. Um, for other diseases, you can see lots and lots of effort, um, you know, and you can see changes in effort as well. So things like um, dengue sort of had a, a, a huge sort of uh, growth in interest, and things like cholera actually declining, waning interest, at least from the literature um, perspective. And when you kind of map that towards uh, onto onto the burden in, in, in terms of deaths, we don't have good burden data on, mort on, on morbidity. Um, you can sort of s start to pass out the kind of like uh, the, the sort of difference between these different diseases in terms of burden. You can see snake bites kind of pretty well up there with some of these really nasty things like cholera, um, you know, lush mania, <coughs> rabies, and schisto. And then when you correct that for the number of publications, for sure, snake bite is by far the most neglected tropical disease, if we're going to call it a tropical disease. Um, so where does this information come from? One source is the Global Burden of Snake Bite study, which some colleagues of mine, they've now become my colleagues, since I didn't know anything about snake bite, I started just talking to them. Um, they put out a study in 2008 where they compiled all the, the data in the literature to try to get a, a handle on you know, what the sort of global burden was looking like. And I think the thing for me that's kind of amazing is that you know, the, the, the map is dominated by kind of like the light blue countries, which are countries with absolutely no data. So how do you know, like it's amazing to think that you, 
you don't know if your population's being knocked off by snakes, but you know, okay, that, that is how it is. We, we just don't know. Um, and there are some countries where we have some data and some countries where we have like grey literature data. And, and this team uh, put this, this information <coughs> together and came up with these numbers of about you know, anywhere between you know, 20 to 100,000 deaths a year. Um, the way they did that is they sort of imputed for countries missing data, they just sort of put them in these global burden of disease regions and then just sort of borrowed information from you know, next door neighbours, so to speak. So you can see that there's quite large variation in this is incidence um, at the global level. It looks like there's this sort of tropical band, so it's consistent with the tropical disease uh, idea. Um, but the, the big thing here is that there's lots of, lots of missing data. So I wanted to um, kind of just think about whether we could maybe do something a little bit more than just guess from our neighbours. So I pulled all the information from that, that study uh, with, with, with this team's help and um, took the countries with data and then just explored for patterns, essentially. It was, a, it was essentially like a walk in the in, you know, snake bike park, so to speak. Um, and you know, took some covariates at the country level, put it into a number of different modeling kind of frameworks and fished around and came up with this kind of composite metric of you know, important versus not very important covariates for this burden. Uh, this is the result for, for mortality, but also did the same thing for incidents. Um, and what this allows me to do is kind of like rank the things that are sort of you know, probably the, the, the more important things to, to, to think about with respect to snake bite burden. So things that came out for mortali mortality, at least, is health expenditure. You can pretty quickly get rid of uh, snake bite deaths if you spend you know, money on your, on your population. Um, the percentage of people employed in agriculture, there's a climate effect. Um, and then interestingly, um, there's a venomous snake richness effect, the biodiversity of, of the venomous snake uh, uh, that, that, are, that, that are in each country. And then like a whole bunch of other stuff that didn't, you, know, you could hypothesize that they should be relevant in some way, but they don't come up as being statistically very useful for predicting those global patterns. Um, so I just took the top four variables from that model and, and um, created some partial dependence plots, which, which kind of tries to give you a picture of the sort of independent effect of each variable, controlling for all the other variables. So you can see that, as I, as I mentioned, you, you, you start spending anything on, <coughs> on your health system and you can reduce the mortality burden. Um, that's less so for, for incidents, uh, but it's, it, it actually is still there. Uh, people uh, are dying uh, when your country's got much, much higher percentage of the population working in agriculture. Um, and there's this climate effect, there's the tropicalization effect, uh, and then there's this biodiversity effect. So it's, this real, it's a real combination of social and ecological factors. Um, I'll skip this other than to just say that we, you know, that I also sort of tried to look at interactions between these variables as well. There are, there's, you know, some, some interactions there. Um, and then use that model to predict onto countries where we didn't, didn't have data. So this is kind of a combined model and that's kind of pretty consistent with what the global burden of disease study suggested, although I get slightly more deaths, so getting up towards at the high end, 140,000 uh, deaths a year. Um, at the national scale, we have an, another sort of bit of evidence that we can use. There's uh, some collaborators, the same collaborators actually had been doing surveys in, in Sri Lanka. They went out and surveyed nearly 1% of the population of Sri Lanka, which is unbelievable. Um, this is where they went. And then they came up with some, some spatial models to try to explain the, the variation in, in incidence and, and venoming. Um, and they found some slightly similar things. They found this effect with climate, uh, elevation effect, they found a, a population, social kind of effect, and then this agricultural workers thing came out. And then for envenoming, uh, l less of that, less of the social factors and more of the environmental factors. And so envenoming, that should say drier, more common in the sort of drier zones, whereas the bites themselves are more common in the wet zones. Another national study, this is in India, uh, shows this very strong seasonal pattern uh, for snake bite, uh, which is really interesting. The majority of bites are occurring during the monsoon season. Um, so we've got another piece of information that's sort of implicating climate or weather. Um, and so I coupled that uh, you know, in, a, in a really simple way. Um, well, actually I should say this, they, they also looked at all these other risk factors. So this is the seasonal effect that I just showed, but you also have these 
social risk factors as well. So you know where you are, what your religion is, uh, you know your occupation, and the types of things I was already talking about. Um, so I took that seasonal effect and coupled it with a climate projection. This is literally the back of an envelope um, calculation accounting for population growth uh, in, in in India over time, and had a look at what the sort of um, the change in the monsoon might do if, if every, all things remain the same. What would that do to to this? this uh, snake-like burden and it looks like through time with slightly increasing temperatures it could splay the the, um, the active light season out a little bit um, and things get a bit warmer uh, things get a bit wetter in, in the monsoon and a bit more unpredictable other times of the year and the excess uh, in terms of snake bite death attributable to those changes is this black line and you can see by 2050 the model suggests that maybe 15,000 extra people a year might be might be getting knocked off by snakes um, so that led to this really simple conceptual model which I used as the basis of developing a, a narrative for, for, um, for a grant, getting the collaborators together. Um, it basically revolves around this idea that there's this biodiversity <coughs> environment and, and social uh, you know, landscape um, and we need to understand a lot of that stuff if we want to make any progress on this, on this problem. A um, couple of ways that, that I'm starting to think about snake bite thinking of it as a human wildlife conflict issue. Um, there's both a real threat in terms of the burden, that's very clear, there's also a perceived threat. People don't like snakes for the potential that they could do harm. Um, and there's, and that, that leads to a conservation conflict because snakes are a persecuted group and often have a conservation status. So for example, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, they have very good biodiversity protection laws except for the eight medically relevant venomous species of snakes, completely excluded from conservation plants. Um, and uh, another way to think about it is, is, is from an ecosystem service disservice type perspective. So Rob Dunn put out this great paper a couple of years ago just saying, hey, ecosystem service evaluators, get with the program, you've got to count the disservices as well as the services in order for this framework to be, to be um, you know, a robust, transparent tool. So that's, uh, that brought me to uh, this kind of ecosystem service disservice idea I put in for a small grant at, at the at BES uh, which helped get this this work off the ground and um, recently that we, we found out we got funded by the MRC to explore this, this issue in more detail looking at, at spatial mapping uh, and, and also temporal mapping under, under scenarios of global change um, and you know irrespective of the, the system you know, the framework or the, 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 the kind of overarching framework we've been thinking about this the aims of the project are going to be to essentially <laughs> using a you know, Matt Damon's <laughs> now famous quote of science the shit out of snake like because nobody, nobody's really doing that. Um, the, 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 one of the key things actually is, is this is an opportunity and we, we sort of saw the opportunity to get ecologists working with clinicians. So most of the people working on snake like are doctors uh, and epidemiologists and basically ecologists haven't been there. So this is like an opportunity for ecologists to start collaborating with the medical folks which ever worked with medical folks before can be the biggest challenge is getting to work with them in the first place <laughs> or getting them to work with you rather it's just a subtle difference um, so we're going to update the 10 year uh, the global burden of disease of, of uh, snake bite study the 10 year update um, we're going to do a bunch of snake ecology stuff um, try to do some risk mapping um, do some behavioral interaction stuff uh, and then and then try to to once we know the kind of mechanisms better try to work in these climate and land use change um, projections in order to make some useful recommendations about mitigating uh, and adaptating uh, and, 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 and adapting to the snake bite risk through through time. And hopefully that'll also lead to good outcomes for snakes as well. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chris. Um, one or two questions before lunch. Just, I suppose, a basic question. How do you plan to tease out the causality here in, in the context of so much correlation? Yeah, w with respect to which particular component? Well, <laughs> the, all the national statistics, I suppose, of healthcare expenditure. I was also thinking that the, the diverse species richness of snakes, I yeah. wonder if that should really be taken as a proxy for density. In snakes. Could be, yeah. So that's what we want to kind of look at with the... With the, the we, we have a snake occupancy component to the project where we're, we're going to try and look at 
distributions of, of the key species of venomous snakes, of which there, I think there are eight in, in Sri Lanka. So we're starting in Sri Lanka at a very uh, fine spatial scale and um, yeah, developing some spatial models about, uh, about where they are, where they, where they prefer, you know, their habitat types and all that kind of stuff. Doing some maybe basic species distribution modeling, which we might then be able to use as some indicator of abundance. It's, it's quite hard to get data on snakes, actually. You know, they, you know, they're super cryptic. Nobody likes looking for them. Um, and you know, there's not much available data. So we, we're really starting from, from scratch, actually. So uh, we'll see how we go. Um, I was just wondering how the pet industry kind of fits into that. Like, is there any data out there, or is there even a conflict occasionally between pets and pet industry? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a there is a big big snake trade, and there's plenty of like uh, people that keep dangerous snakes. As, as pets, but I'm not sure how it necessarily relates to this, apart from the conservation angle that in, in other systems, pet trade is, is linked to some conservation issues, either through over-harvesting or introduction of you know, diseases and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, but I'm not sure. If you have ideas, come and tell me. Well, with that, we'll wrap up, and you can just talk to Chris afterwards. And please, one big applause for all the speakers for today's session. I actually know some people that like uh, camping uh, bikers for a generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where my parents have a house, I'd go for So the, the biodiversity metric that I used in these analysis yep. was venomous snakes um, yes, passed out from everything else they do. Into, you know, no, I mean I can understand. No, I can understand that um, from a medical perspective, if you're thinking about the human wildlife conflict, that's most right, people yeah. cannot think they have no idea right, what's yeah. venomous snake and what isn't. So yeah. From that yeah, that's aspect. definitely on our radar. We, uh,